Hey there, everybody. Good morning and welcome to Foundations. And uh, today, on our marvelous day, today is October the ooh, 6th. Almost forgot, had to look at my watch. October the 6th, 2023. Miss June, who commented last week that I said 2022, and Mr. Jack Hart, who brought up as well the fact that I said 2022. You're the only two that caught my slip of tongue, and so congratulations. Today, you can't catch me. It's 2023. Everybody wants to be right at least once in their life. This morning, I'd like to be right. So welcome to Friday morning, October 6, 2023. Welcome to Foundations. Glad you joined me here this morning. Hope you're having a good morning. Hope it's a, a nice Friday for you. My Friday has been underway for a number of hours. Um, I uh, enjoyed a 3.30 wake up this morning. Don't know why. Did not go back to sleep. So if I fall asleep during Foundations, you'll know that not only am I boring when I preach, I'm also boring when I do Foundations. And <laughs> I fell asleep on myself. So there we go. Yep. Well, to kind of keep my morning going, um, obviously had a little bit of breakfast, get myself going, and I've already put a number of uh, ounces of caffeine, not coffee, Mountain Dew, into my system this morning, Diet Mountain Dew. Um, so yeah, that's how I'm, I'm operating today. So if I talk a little faster, hopefully I won't. It's because I am in a place where caffeine has taken over my world, so... Uh, so good morning, everybody. Welcome again. Uh, so let's jump right in for today's question. Um, this morning I was driving by and uh, noticed the donut shop and um, thought to myself, man, one of my all-time favorites as far as those little pieces of dough that you can pick up at the donut shop is apple fritters. And I was wondering this morning as I was driving in, I thought, oh, I'm going to replace my question this morning with this question. Of course, the other one's probably important too, but this one to me is more important. And this morning, I wonder, what is your favorite style of pastry, donut, or whatever you call it? Mine happens to be apple fritters. Every time I go to a donut shop that has apple fritters, forget the donuts, give me the apple fritter, especially if they have chunks of apple in it. I love apple fritters. So there we go. If you want to do something big in my life, buy an apple fritter, drop it off here at the office, and uh, you will make a friend in the short man chaplain. So, all right. So what is your favorite pastry, donut, etc.? Comment down below. Let me know what that is. And uh, appreciate you joining me this morning and sharing your thoughts on the sugar you consume. All right. Um, this week, we're starting a brand new series called The. The. OK. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, I was setting this past week, contemplating this series on the. And we're going to talk about some the's that are important. And... Um, I was sitting at a uh, um, funeral this past week, and it's it's really interesting if you think about how many fun things happen in life, and funerals are sometimes not places we think of fun things happening, but I observed something this past week at a funeral that I thought was fun, and it really illustrates the power of things, um, and we're going to talk about the power of things today. For instance, there's a baby that was at the funeral setting in mom and dad's uh passing arms back and forth to kind of, you know, pacify the baby with a pacifier and keep the baby from crying and so and so on. But what I thought was really cute was this, as I looked up, and as I looked up, the baby was looking back at me. I find babies look at me a lot. I look like a grandpa. I think that's what it is. But babies seem to think uh, I look like a grandpa, or it could be the fact they look at me and think I'm their height. That could be as well. So, uh, but this baby, probably seven or eight months old or whatever. And so I just looked up and did what I do with babies because babies are cute. And I just smiled at the baby and the uh, baby looked back at me and a baby smiled. And it was interesting, the power of a smile and how that little baby caught on to the smile and smiled as well. Well, it didn't stop there. The baby then was looking around and uh, catching the eye of many gawking adults that thought the baby was cute and uh, turned to this older couple and smiled at the lady who was sitting there. And, of course, then she had to smile. So then she smiles. She turns to her husband, and she says something, kind of gives him the elbow, and then looks back, and then he smiles. And I thought about how powerful it is when we smile. Now, there's a small message there. It's not the message of the morning, but there is a small message there. Have you ever noticed how someone, when they smile or when they chuckle, it can be contagious. 
and other people kind of pick up on it and start doing it as well. It's kind of cute. Have you ever noticed the power of an attitude, for instance? Um, I noticed this past week there was a young person that was in a really difficult circumstance um, working in a fast food restaurant, which is a very difficult place to work, especially um, in our world today where it seems like that nobody has any amount of respect for the people working behind the counter. And if you had to do what those people behind the counter had to do, listen to me, you would want other folks to pay attention and at least give you respect as well. They work hard and they make sure you have your food. And if you don't think much about honoring those people behind the fast food counter, it's because you've never had to be behind a fast food counter. But for those of us who have been behind the counter before, let me tell you something, your behavior is noticed. And the behavior of the people around this young person was being affected by the behavior of the people on the other side of the counter. The people on the other side of the counter were relatively unkind. And yet this one young person would not let that happen. And so because of that, they kept their attitude in, t in check. They kept a good attitude despite the bad attitude of the customer on the other side of the, of the counter. As a result, they actually got some of their coworkers to kind of lighten up a little bit, especially after the grumpy little person who made the remarks they made went away and was able to turn their coworkers around. The kid could not have been much more than 16 or 17, probably 30. At my age, 30 looks like 16 or 17. But the power of that attitude really changed the whole atmosphere of what was going on there in that restaurant at that moment. Or what about this? You've seen the power of faith before, right? Now, I want to take just a minute. I'm not talking about Christian faith. I'm talking about faith. The power of faith. It's crazy how when someone believes in something, you cannot get them to get away from it. They're not so easily persuaded to go another direction. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a fan, okay? Uh, I don't need any comments on the bottom here, but I do know this. I have some family. I have some friends who believe in a few things, okay? They believe in some things that if I said them, you'd say, oh, there's no way that is. But let me tell you something. Their faith in the fact that these things actually exist, hairy creatures, little green men, so on and so forth, okay? Their faith in the fact that they exist will be absolutely overwhelming when they get an opportunity to share that with you. You can chuckle. You can push back. You can even tell them you don't believe, and yet it does not change the faith they have in what they believe. And that faith, even sometimes when it's misplaced, is powerful. Have you ever seen someone follow a cult leader? Their faith is strong. It is absolutely amazing the power of that faith that they have to follow in the light sometimes of many untruths. And yet they follow them implicitly. And they follow them with great devotion. You see, things impact our life. Faith impacts our life. There's a power that things have. And so to drive home this first the topic of power, I want to press you on three areas I believe as someone who is in the body of Christ should pay attention to. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about any one of these three. I would recommend you pay attention, but listen, because you don't follow Jesus, you're not any, under any obligation to pay attention to these three items. You might actually listen to me say them and ask yourself, I wonder why Christians don't do a better job at those. Well, it doesn't matter. We're imperfect, but thankful for Jesus, we're all together. And we might be in what seems like a sinking ship, but let me tell you something, it really is, in this world that we live in, the only boat afloat even though you may think it's going down. Jesus is a family of people, a body of believers that have total and absolute, amazing, unbelievable power. I want to talk about the power of three things that you and I as believers and that follow Jesus Christ need to pay close attention to. Number one is this, and I believe it's the top priority. That's why I made it number one. And it's really undervalued and not paid attention to as much as it should. The power of unity. The power of unity. It's one thing for a handful of Jesus' followers to get together in a church where they all agree. 
But it's another thing when you get around other believers who have some different beliefs than what you have. Not a different Savior, not heretical beliefs, but sometimes the difference in the way they believe as far as maybe the way that you would do a certain church service or do a certain type of politics or do something that is in the culture differently. Maybe some of you go to movies, some don't. And it's interesting how often we have allowed these topics, these things which are non-essentials oftentimes, which are peripheral doctrines that are put out by mankind rather than by Scripture. Listen, you won't find it anywhere in Scripture to address what to do politically or what to do as far as going to movies. Now, you can come up with some convictions from Scripture, but you won't see anywhere where it says a particular party is correct or a particular type of movie or a particular rating of a movie has anything to do with right or wrong. That's convictions, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's amazing how we let these type of things tear down the unity of the body of Christ. Unity is the absolute most powerful thing, I believe, that the followers of Jesus Christ can do. Let me tell you why. It's extremely, extremely important for you to listen to these words from John chapter 17. Listen as Jesus is giving what is called the high priestly prayer as he prays to the Father and he's praying for his disciples. He's praying for you and I as he talks about those who will believe because the disciples begin to teach and that's carried on from that point forward. So as a result, you and I are actually in his prayer. Jesus is praying for you and me as well. Listen up. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, the term unity, basically. Then he says, just as you and I, Father, are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you have sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. And may they also be so that the world would believe you sent me. Do you realize what Jesus just said? It's found in John chapter 17. Go check it out. It starts around the 18th through the 25th verse. Talks about the things he's praying and specifically about unity. He says that our unity not union, okay? Unity is togetherness. Union is complete agreement. Union is a contract that says we all agree on the same things. Unity is the absolute core of believers who are different coming together knowing they are one even though they are different. He says, uh, Paul writes, how can the eye say to the foot, I don't need you? How can all of that? I mean, amazing, absolutely amazing how he says, you and I cannot deny the other parts of the body of Christ because we belong to the same body. We have different ways in which we do things, different gifts and so on, but we are yet in unity. We are one in Christ. How powerful that is, is that when we are in unity, when we get along with people from different denominations or different churches or non-denominational churches or whatever, but we are centered around the reality of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified, buried, and risen again, when we unify around the message of the gospel, he says that the world will then actually believe who he is. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that we do this some, like some magic trick and people just everybody just believes. I'm talking about the fact that you need to recognize that unity actually makes them question who Jesus was. When you are not unified with other believers, you actually create a question in their mind as to whether or not Jesus was real or that Jesus was the Son of God. That's the implications. And when we are one, we are unified, he says that people will then believe the world Those who are living outside of the gospel will believe that God sent Jesus to be the sacrifice for sins. How powerful is the power of unity? We need to guard it. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, it doesn't talk about that we would create the unity. It is that we guard the unity. In other words, it is your responsibility and my responsibility to do everything we can to guard 
ourselves, our tongues, our attitudes, and our actions when it comes to other believers, that we're to prefer others over ourselves. That's what he wrote. Uh, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2. We are to actually treat other believers better than we treat ourselves. That's what he says. You see, you and I need to recognize how powerful unity is. Unity will unite the world around the message of Jesus Christ. And then the second thing I think is so powerful that Christians need to recognize is the power of convictions. Do you realize how often we set our convictions on many things that have nothing to do with Jesus? It's not wrong to have some convictions. It's not wrong to to believe in certain things. I happen to believe that baseball is the best game ever played. Footballers might disagree. Play, hockey players might absolutely argue with me. And that's a lot of fun. But it's not so much fun when you and I turn our convictions into just wishy-washy things that seem to waver every time we breathe. As a matter of fact, today, convictions have gone by the wayside, not because the core of the gospel and the truth of the scripture has gone away, but because we have taken theologies that are less than a, cent- a quarter century old, and we have put them on the front line And we have backed out the gospel and we've made all of these different things the force behind what we say God is about when God is not about any of these doctrines. It is sad that we have come to this place. You say, well, what doctrines are you talking about? You don't have to even have me say them. The moment I begin talking about doctrines that are less than a quarter of a century old, you know what's been added to the church in the course of the last 25 years that are not, absolutely not, scriptural. And we hold these things and we cancel other people because of it. And we act like foolish unbelievers and we fight amongst ourselves. And Paul wrote in one particular letter, he said, be careful that you do not devour each other. You see, when you and I do not have convictions that are based in Scripture, that are centered on the man of Jesus Christ, who was the absolute center of all of our faith, who is the absolute answer for all of our sin, if we cannot have the conviction to start there and what is said about his life, then we are missing out on the entire written word. You see, the reason the Old Testament exists is to show the history of mankind up until God brought his son here on earth. That's why there's prophecy in the Old Testament to say there's one coming. And that's why there's prophecy at the end to say he's coming back again at the end of the New Testament. That's why there's things written about the man by the name of Jacob, who's later come to be Israel. It's why Israel existed, because out of the 12 tribes of Israel comes one particular tribe. And that particular tribe is the tribe of Judah from which David would be, from which the Savior would be in the line. And then therefore it points all the way to the one reason why Scripture even exists. And that is so that the God that made the universe and his Son and the Holy Spirit that is part of all three impacts our life and causes us to understand salvation and understand holiness and understand what it looks like to walk as a believer. When you walk in convictions... It is not easy for you to be swayed by just something someone says or writes in a book. You don't have to check your brain at the door and try to be some type of intellectual because you start believing things because somebody who has a letter behind their name says it's true. A letter behind your name does not make you an authority. The scripture guides all the things that we need to believe. You can say it's just all old fashioned and that's fine. But let me tell you something, something that has been preserved for this many years, that has been quoted more often than any other author or any other book, that has more copies and more evidence of its existence than any other written material on this earth. You should pay attention to it because God has done everything he has in his power to keep the scriptures until this day. So you and I could see the truth of who Jesus Christ is. We would trust him for salvation. We need to have the power of convictions in our lives. We need to have the power of convictions that are not easily swayed, that we're not flown, uh, uh, thrown back and forth, as James says, like a reed in the water.
from one doctrine to another, from one belief to another, but that we center and we always look at the fact that we center on Jesus Christ. One last comment on this idea of convictions. Listen to me, because I think some of us were raised in a place where we thought that the letters of Paul were a bunch of new rules that we needed to live by. But if you look at Paul's writings, you'll find this reality. When you look at every letter that's written, you'll find this reality. Every New Testament letter does this one thing. It points people who were walking away from the conviction of who Jesus Christ was back to the reality and the conviction that he was the Son of God. Every letter does the same thing and addresses different issues that were distracting the body of Christ as we are being distracted by things that are not truly convictions of the scripture, they're being distracted like we're being distracted today. Do not allow your convictions in who Jesus is to be distracted. Do not allow sinful behaviors and actions and actions and all of the things that would take you away from just the reality of what sin looks like. Why would you allow that to pull you away? Do not allow those things to do so. Conviction conviction. The truth matters. And the truth always has its basis in things that you can prove, not just things you believe in. That is what conviction does. You see, convictions can change some. I get it. But convictions have a core, and that core is Jesus. What is at the core of your convictions? So the power of unity, the power of convictions, And then this one, I believe, is the one that sets all of the others free. This is the one that sets all the others in motion. This is the one that is the most unbelievably amazing part of who God is, who Jesus is, and how the Holy Spirit works. The power of grace. Talked about it last week. I said it's my favorite topic to talk about. Here I am again talking about it. I'll probably repeat the word grace a million times before I die. Because if it were not for the grace of God, I would not have the hope of eternity. If it were not for the grace of God, I would have no way to put things that I do that are sinful, even as a believer sometimes. I have no way to put them behind me if it's not for the grace of God. I have no way to live the convictions I have if it were not for the grace of God. I have no way to be a person of unity if it is not for the grace of God. The power of grace is absolutely outside of our boundaries. We cannot forgive the way grace forgives. We think we can, but we can't. We hang on to stuff. It's so hard to let go of stuff, and yet God says, I put your sins as far as the east is from the west. Why? Grace. Grace gives you that distance. Grace gives you that power. Grace gives you that opportunity. Grace gives you that freedom. Unity brings us together. Convictions weld us together around the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Then grace transforms that truth and takes our situations and makes them different. It changes our lives so that we're no longer rule keepers, even though the rules matter. We realize that by breaking any rules that we're actually grieving the Holy Spirit, which it gives us the grace to come back to our Savior, who said that if we confess our sins, he forgives us. Grace helps us recognize the powerful forgiveness of God. And then it says to us, you've been forgiven much, now forgive others much. Grace allows us to overlook sin that someone has done and to tell them that they can find wholeness beyond that sin. Yes, it forgives you of your sin so that you can forgive others who hurt you. And if you're going to be made right with God, it is only going to be through grace. Grace keeps us living right. Grace keeps us thinking right. Grace keeps us loving right. Grace keeps us unified. Grace keeps us focused on the convictions of who Jesus Christ is. Grace is the power behind the ways that you will reach out to others. Grace releases guilt. Grace releases you from your past. Grace turns you around and helps you live a repented life going in the other direction. Grace is so powerful that when it is practiced, it makes you peculiar and has others wondering what in the world is up in your life. And if you live in the power of that grace, people will see the unity you have with other believers. 
They will see the deep convictions you hold to about who Jesus is. And then they themselves will begin to wonder what it would be like to trust Jesus for that same grace. And believe it or not, believe it or not, some will trust and they will experience that grace. All because you knew the power of living a grace-filled life. Wow. I can't say it enough. I cannot say it enough. Live in grace and you'll be like a city on a hill that's lit and cannot be hid. Live in grace. Live in convictions. And live in unity. The power of that will transform this world. It will transform those in your world. I'm not so naive to think the entire world's going to turn to Jesus. But I'm also not so silly. I'm not so um, uh, harsh and so hardened that I cannot believe that I'd like to see one more. If today's the last day I have on earth, one more person understand grace a little more. And maybe, maybe they would turn loose of their sin and let Jesus give them the grace that he gave through his own blood. And he gave us the hope on that third day. Man, I'd like for one more person to experience grace today, all because I lived in grace. That's what I'd like to have happen. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, would you trust that grace? Please, would you be the one person? If you've trusted Christ, would you do this today for me? Would you begin to live in the power of grace so your convictions and your unity begin to line out according to what you receive from the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, and through the indwelling of His Holy Spirit? Would you do that? Let's live in some power. The power that God gives us through His Son. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Before I get out of here this morning, remember, here's the question. I know that you know that you know that I like apple fritters, that I put enough on the front side about it, and if you want to give me one, drop it off at the office. But what's your favorite pastry? What's your favorite donut? What's your favorite sweet thing in a package or in a donut case? Tell me what your favorite is. Comment down below. Thank you so much for your time this morning. I can't tell you how much it means to me to spend time with you. can't tell you how much it means to me to have you comment and have you join in. But more importantly than any of that, if this all went by the wayside, if tomorrow I no longer did this, what would allow me to know that is that uh, life was good and the time I spent here would be to know, as Jesus would say, as he would look and say, well done. I want you to live that well done. I want you to live in those convictions, not because I said them, but because Jesus said them and because they're true. And when I'm long gone, others will echo that same word. And because of the Holy Spirit working in this world until the time that Jesus comes back, those words will continue to echo in our history. You and I can live in power. Thank you so much again. Hey, share uh, foundations with your family and friends, and um, let's, uh, let's enjoy each other's company. Let's build a foundation of our faith around the one who is the only foundation, Jesus Christ. All right? You all have a great Friday now. Hope you enjoy your weekend. I'm going to enjoy my weekend. going to have some family get-togethers. going to get to see my grandkids. There's nothing better in the world at my age than having those little things around and having them hug and tell you how wonderful you are as a grandpa. Yep. So have a great Friday. Have an amazing weekend. And we will see you next week. All right. Y'all take care now. Bye-bye.